Father, um, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 time we uh, have come to uh, this year as, as we turn our hearts and our minds on, on what your son did for us 2,000 years ago. The willingness to die in our place, that the King of all kings, that the Lord of all lords, that Jesus Christ himself the Son of God, where, where, where there is no other name in, in all of creation that is greater, would relinquish His glory and come down and die in our place. Father, turn our minds and our hearts to that, that period of time as we hear a message from Your Word. It's in the precious blood I pray. Amen. Before we get started with today's message, I am missing a prop and I need help. Ah, uh, I need to call on one of you to sacrifice, sitting next to your lovely spouse, if you are a man, and to come up here for the entire sermon. You might be abused. I shouldn't have said that part until I actually got a volunteer. John, you really look the part, so you got the... You, you look like a Judas, so uh, not quite yet. Of course, Judas did not. I I could have got the heavy clothes. I didn't do the heavy clothes. I have light, so uh, it gets hot up here. A lot of hot air. There you go. Oh, that's not a turban at all. We're going to pretend it is. There you go. <laughs> Doesn't he look like he could just be plucked out of... Sit, have, a, have a seat in your throne. Okay, John, do you remember the one sermon I did? Along, or not the sermon, but we went to Chicago. We were doing street evangelism, and I wore the shiny shirt, and I accidentally got carried away and slapped you in the back of the head. Yeah, remember that one? Remember <laughs> you still remember that? It this still hurts. This is not unlike that, but I will, I will do my best. <laughs> Okay, this, my friend, is Judas. Okay, what do we say to when we meet? If you were to meet Judas, what would you say as an audience? Hi, Ju would, would anyone boo Judas? We got one person who would boo Judas. Do you guys think I'm setting you up? We really need, um, I, I mean this, I'm not lying. Behind you, Greg, is a Bible, a little red Bible. Can I get that? I, I have to go to get it now because nobody <laughs> believes me. No, right? Is it gone? <laughs> now somebody took it from me. No, I didn't leave it at the store. I had it right here. I need a Bible. I just marked it, didn't I? I was back there marking it. You can pause this from the sermon. Where's my little red Bible? No, uh, seriously, it's gone. I'm not kidding. Somebody has taken it. There it is. No, seriously, it's here. I mean, I was not. See, that's a brown Bible. All right, I'm going to just steal it. I want to share a passage with you and, and give you... It, no, it's not Krista. Seriously, it's here in this building. I can't believe I actually lost my... Somebody took it from me. Trying to play a mean trick on me. Okay, I'm going to read. I'm going to read the passage. In fact, everyone go to Matthew chapter 29. Matthew chapter 29. Go to Matthew chapter 29. When you get there, you'll realize that Matthew chapter 29 does not exist, so then you'll go back to Matthew chapter 26. <laughs> I heard a lot of Bible flipping right there. Matthew chapter 26. Let me see your... your uh, there you go. I'm not there yet. This is your Bible reading for the day. Mine was marked. I can see that. I'm going to flip around real quick. Matthew 26, 14 says this. Then one of the twelve... 
the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted him out 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And then we jump to verse 47. And this is after the Lord's Supper. This is after Jesus revealed uh, that one at that table would betray him. We read this. It says, while he was still speaking, we're referring to Jesus, Jesus, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him. There was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man... Arrest him. Going at once to Judas, Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. And then we are going to jump ahead in time after Jesus had had begun the process of being tried. We have the response of Judas. 27.1 reads this, Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, they led him away to hand him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is this to us, they replied? That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and he hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy potter's field at the burial place for foreigners. This is why it is called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the silver coins, the price set for him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Hmm. Do you know of anybody? who at one time accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, was baptized in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, who who walked with God and then turned their back on Him. Do you know of anybody, maybe in your family, who, who... I don't know, went to a youth group when they were younger and was gung-ho for Jesus Christ, but as they got older, they, they left and never came back and maybe even died without ever returning to the faith. You guys are Baptists, right? Once saved, always saved. I guess that doesn't apply to everybody, huh? Especially somebody like this pathetic piece of crap. Judas Iscariot. Oh, he was, he was one of the twelve chosen by Jesus Christ himself. Had a prominent position of authority. A treasure, I do believe. How's your treasure? A man of God? Somebody that you can trust with everything that you've got. That's who this piece of crap was. Nobody likes this guy. And what I find really, really funny is that so many of you are just like him. One decision away, one decision away of turning their back on Jesus Christ and being lost forever, once saved, always saved. What a joke. You should have saw the face of Jesus Christ when he betrayed him with a kiss. 
if this man who was so close to Jesus Christ could, be betray, could betray him. Not a single one of you can be saved. The Bible tells us to be on guard whenever the devil speaks. It says that his native tongue is a lie. Every time he opens up his mouth, he takes a piece of scripture or he'll take a piece of truth or he'll take something that, that, is, 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 that sounds so right and he'll twist it in such a way that makes you believe it. Be on very guard. Was Judas chosen by Jesus Christ to be the twelve? Yes, but was he chosen to be a child of God? Was Judas chosen to be a child of God? The answer is no, no. It didn't come out of shock to, a shock to Jesus. In fact, it says on the scriptures, it's on, it's on our board right back here from the word of God. Jesus said this. He said, he, he said, have I not chosen you? He was talking to the 12 disciples. But one of you is the devil. I have searched the scriptures. I have read the scriptures and even in preparation of this sermon today and I have never ever once found one place in the scripture or there is an example of an individual who was once baptized, a true believer, who received the Holy Spirit of God, who then lost his salvation. Not one example. There are tons of examples of people in the Bible who were religious. There were people who said that they were followers of God. There were many people who said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But they turned out to be nothing more than whitewashed tombs. Looking good on the outside, but full of dead man bones on the inside. I have a definition for religious that I want to give you. And I, and, and I want you to take this to heart because one of the things that I think we're all responsible for is when it comes to teachers and preachers is we need to make sure that we're not listening to a religious person, but we're, we need to make sure that we are listening to someone who is indeed saved by Jesus Christ. And we also want to take this and, and test ourselves to make sure that we're not a religious person so much as somebody who is saved by Christ. Here's, the, here's, what I, here's how I define religion. Religion is this. A person who changes their behavior, but their character remains the same. A person who changes their behavior, but their character changes the same. Judas, one of the twelve, looked upright. Looked like he was chosen as, as, as a man who could be trusted for everything. But inside, he was filthy. Dead man bones. There are, in the Bible, there's a couple of indicators. I want to just quickly go over them with you real quick of how you can tell if a person is truly in tune with God. How you can tell if you're in tune with God. Or how, how maybe if you're religious. And again, it's never our position to judge a person. But because there's so many false teachers, we do have to answer the question. One of them is Fruit. Right? Fruit. Christianity should be defined as this. A person whose behavior changes because there is a true character change. Done by the Holy Spirit. I kid you not, I have taken a knife to somebody. I kid you not, I have tried to kill a person. I kid you not, I hated people with a passion and I wish they'd die. There were great songs by Guns N' Roses that testified to my heart that everybody served me. And that fateful day when I was at Promise Keepers and convicted because of the sins that I had and I walked that, that long aisle down to the altar and I bowed a knee in humble adoration towards Jesus Christ who died for me and tears flowing from my, from my eyes, something happened inside my heart that I can't even testify to. That it was as if God stuck his hand into my chest and said, dead heart live. From that day on I started to love. And you could see it in my behavior. 
I serve you, I serve the community, I serve everybody that I possibly can. I give my time, my labor, my very life so that I can help people. Not because I'm living by a set of rules, but because my heart has changed. I've got a long way to go. You could probably say amen to that. But there's a true change in character. You've got to look for that fruit. But there's a second thing that, that really needs to... Sometimes the fruit that you know we can, we can present ourselves as being holy, as sanctimonious, as, as, as religious and full. Some of the people, most of the time, of course, what's truly in our heart is going to leak out of our face. But nevertheless, you can put on that front. There's a second thing that testifies to, to, to whether or not you are indeed in Christ. You know what that is? Longevity. Longevity. A prodigal son is one that does what? Leaves the faith and comes back. I've been to a lot of funerals and I preach a lot of funerals where somebody has come up to me and they've asked me, will you preach the funeral of my beloved brother or my sister or my grandmother or my good friend right here? And I always ask a couple of questions. One of the questions I ask, and it's a really good question to know, especially if I'm about to give a message over, over their dead body, is this. Were they indeed saved? A lot of times I hear that. Here's the answer I get a lot of times. It's this. Well... When they were in high school, they went to a youth group. And I remember this one time that there was this message. It was a really powerful gospel message. And, 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 and my brother, my sister, my whoever, he went down the altar. She went down the altar and they gave their life to Christ. And it was two weeks later they were baptized. But then they went away. And they never came back. So yes, they were indeed saved. They were a prodigal son. I don't judge anybody. A person can go to their deathbed and have a real conversation with their maker and come back. I believe that's true. But I wouldn't want to have that testimony on the day when I stand in front of my maker that a long time ago I was walking in the faith but I walked away from it and I never came back. I wouldn't want that testimony. That's not the testimony of a prodigal son. That's not the testimony of a child of God. In fact, in, in 1 John, the apostle uh, was, was talking about a group who left him, and it's going to be up here, 1 John 2, 19. He says that they went away from us, but they didn't really belong to us in the first place. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them really belonged to this longevity is a testimony of whether or not a person is indeed saved. Judas went away. He never had the fruit and he went away. The devil may tell you that, there, that, that, that it is a testimony of somebody who has lost their salvation, but he's more evidence of a person who was never ever saved the devil is a liar <laughs> I'm the liar see that's the problem with you I give you another reality and I'm the liar did I lie to Eve did I lie to Eve did I lie to Eve? What did I tell that witch? What did I tell her? I said, if you eat from the tree of good, of, of the, the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, you would be like God. Was that a lie? I always get hit for that. I always get hit for that. What did God say? Boom, right there. Come on there. Come on, come on. Genesis, let's go. Genesis 3.22. Put it up there. Behold, the man has become like one of us, too, to know good and evil. I'm the liar. I gave another reality, and she believed me over God. <sighs> I didn't lie to Judas. I don't lie to anybody. Just tell him the truth. <sighs> 
Judas, he had high hopes, you know. Do you know what it would be like to live in a society, in a culture, where your government is bent on killing you? Oh, you got it so bad with your Republican Democrats making you, forcing you to watch those nasty negative ads. Oh, no, I watched four commercials today. You realize in some countries they take your children and they enslave them and they beat them. There are gang rapes in South Africa. Welcome to womanhood. He lived during a time that the Roman soldiers were ruthless, enslaved. Would you want Israel to be enslaved? Do you want them to be treated bad? He wanted a Messiah. He wanted a Messiah who would free them, who would, who would establish a kingdom here and now and make those Romans pay for the horrible things that they did. And God failed him. Jesus failed him. What is this, Palm Sunday, where we celebrate the day that Jesus took a stolen donkey into Jerusalem? And with that stolen donkey, on that stolen donkey, everybody's with the palms up in the air. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Our king has come. And what's the first thing your king did? He's got a coin. Give me a coin, some money. Give me some money. Let's go. You are way too slow. Come on. The bill. <laughs> Yes. Give me another. Come on. <laughs> Whose face is on this? Caesar's. Oh, well then pay Caesar what's his. Oh, there's the king that's going to save us all from the Roman soldiers. Pay your taxes. He should have been flipping chariots. And what was he flipping? Tables. Inside the house of God. He's a failure of a Messiah. I showed it to Judas. And Judas just chose wisely. Judas didn't want a Messiah. He wanted a follower. He wanted Jesus to be something that Jesus never said that he was going to be. Jesus never said that he came to this earth to establish a power base on here, a party, a political party, or a government. He didn't come to bring peace between man. In fact, when he, made, when he came, he actually said, from now on, you're going to have more divisions. You're going to be even div divided in your house. He never gave that promise. It does. It breaks my heart sometimes to baptize young people or to baptize people, and they get so excited about the faith. They get so excited about what Christianity is, and, and, and we do. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and, and we go out and say, you are dead to, to this old way of life. No longer is your heart um, a, a, a dead, nasty, shriveled up human existence but it is alive a new creation and it's sad sometimes when I see them go away and, and when, I, when I start reflecting about it and when I start talking to them it, it, it saddens me how often they had this this high anticipation of who what they thought Jesus was and we're all tempted to do this you know Peter did this too Peter, Peter told Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And Peter's like, you're not going to go to Jerusalem, you're not going to die because you're the king, you're the Messiah, that's not what you do. And, and what, did, what did Jesus say to Peter? Back away from me, Satan, you don't know the things of God, but the things of man. Satan did not want him to go to the cross and die. Now, that would mean restoration between you and God. We're all tempted to do this. 
How many of you have prayed and named your prayers? I'm out of work. God, give me a job. And God doesn't give you a job. Were you asking or telling? If you throw a little hissy fit afterwards, you're probably telling God the answer to your prayer. Jesus doesn't owe us a thing. He doesn't follow us. He doesn't obey us. He says, and if anybody comes after me, they must follow me. And his ways are not our ways. He didn't come to this earth to be served. He didn't come to this earth to rule, but he came to give his life on a ransom, to die on our cross so that we might be saved. And here's the thing. Here's the really nasty little joke that sometimes we don't, we don't preach before we have an altar call. He asked you to do the very same, to give up your life, to serve. Anything else, unfortunately, is from the devil. Isn't that convenient? You ever read to the Bible and wonder if they just made this stuff up as they went along? Jesus wanting to go to the cross. <laughs> Sounds like a politician. When things go bad, that's exactly the way that we wanted it to go in the first place. Tell me, Bible man, able to flip a thousand pages in a single turn. You said, I didn't want Jesus to go to the cross. Why did I enter Judas? If I didn't want Jesus to go to the cross, why did I tempt this man to put him to that cross? Because like it or not, I'm in control. I put him on the cross. I did. Through him. 30 pieces of silver. It was really easy. Just had to whisper into his ear. Do you really, really want to follow this man? Oh, you could get so much for him. 30 pieces of silver. Oh, so sweet. What a pathetic Messiah you follow. Betrayer. The Bible says this in Zechariah eleven thirteen, And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which... They valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. Hundreds of years before G Judas was even conceived, the Lord God prophesied what Judas would do. God is in control. You know what yin and yang is? Is that that's an oriental philosophy that there's an equal good for an equal what? Evil. That there's light 
and that there's dark, that there's good and that there's evil. And these forces keep fighting each other and they keep competing against each other. And then no one side is going to win. Good will never win over evil because evil is just as, as much of an equal force as, as good is. And evil will never, t- never g- gain over good because they're an equal force. That's not a Christian philosophy. Satan is not God's equal. Satan is an unwittingly, Satan unwittingly serves our most holy God. And it was prophesied throughout the scripture. If you turn to Genesis on Genesis chapter three, don't do so now. And you go all the way to Matthew chapter one, you will follow one family line. You'll follow a bloodline. You'll follow the line of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is the story of Jesus Christ himself. And throughout the scriptures, Satan follows the bloodline. He attempts to stop Jesus from going to the cross. It starts all the way with Abel, with 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 um, you have. Abel and Cain coming up, the New Testament reveals to us that it was Satan through Cain who tried to stop the bloodline. And it goes all the way up. It goes all the way up through history. Goes to David, tries to stop the bloodline. Jesus Christ is born. There is an attempt to kill the baby right there. Satan, the demonic forces of B, the authorities in in the dark realms, do whatever they can to stop him. Prophesize. But once Jesus gets to the point where the cross is inevitable, that this is going to happen, that this day is going to happen, Satan still could not resist the urge to play a part. But that too was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. It says, the seed of the woman, which is the virgin birth, child of the Messiah, would crush the head, but the seed of the serpent would strike at his feet. Satan has no power whatsoever in our lives unless it's under the authority of God himself. You lie! I commanded him. I commanded him to make the exchange. To make the exchange, 30 pieces of silver, Jesus Christ, he obeyed me, I gave him the command, you're a liar! Judas didn't make an exchange for any person whatsoever. Judas did not make the exchange for 30 pieces because he never had Jesus in the first place. He never had Jesus as Jesus presented himself. When nobody was looking, the New Testament says, it says that that he would steal from the treasury. That's another good test to see what we are. Who you are when the lights are off, who you are when nobody is looking, that's who you are. If you're a thief when no one's looking, then you're a thief. With religion. He didn't have a choice to make. He was still on the path towards what he wanted. He wanted power, the Romans to pay. He wanted authority. He wanted money. He never wanted Christ as Christ presented himself. He never wanted to be a servant. He never wanted to be second place. And he definitely didn't want to be second place to God in heaven. The scripture says this, and this also speaks to about an individual who, is, who, who can lose their salvation. In Proverbs, or in 2 Peter 2.22, it says, They prove this truth of the Proverbs. A dog returns to his vomit. Another says this, A washed pig returns to the mud. You can wash a pig all you want. You can put it in a bath. You can put it in a car wash. In the end, it's what? A pig. No new creation whatsoever. Poor guy. Hear what you are? You're a pig. That's how them Christians think of you. You're a dog. (laughs) You made a mistake. He turned Jesus Christ over to be crucified. I mean, he wasn't the Messiah that she thought. 
They felt bad for it. He went to the temple to return the money, and then what did they do? They rejected you. The money they gave you for Jesus, they wouldn't take back because blood money. Jesus rejected you. Israel rejects you. They don't like you. Actually, I do think that the rope would be a very good idea for yourself. <laughs> Why not die? The tempter does this to us all. He, does it, he did it with Judas, and I, I am sure that he does it with you, too. He may be messing with you right now in the sense that he's focusing on something that you did so vile, and he's using that guilt to separate you from the love of God. Isn't it funny that... No, it, it does. It says in the Bible that, that no sin comes about um, uh, by God. God doesn't cause anyone to sin, but sin comes about when our own evil desires, it starts here comes to fruition when the tempter comes up to us and then offers us this. The fun, it's not really funny, but it's, it's a teaching in the Bible is that where, where the demonic forces not only tempt us to sin, but the minute that we give in to sin, they're also there to play the part of the accuser, to make you feel guilty and to further separate you from God. I believe that guilt is good if it brings about repentance. I believe that guilt is horrible if it keeps you from the loving arms of God. Satan does that. Demonic forces do that. They do whatever to keep you there. It was Peter. It was Peter who also went through the same. Judas went through the same trials, the same testing as Peter did. And, but Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, you're about ready to go through this trial. Satan's going to take you. But you're a child of God. You believe the promises are here. He said, I'm going to give you the way out. Here's how you do it. It's twofold real quick. Have faith in me. During times of trial, during times of temptation, have faith in me. And if you fail, and he would, turn back to me. If you go the way of the prodigal son, come back to me. And we'll even use that to encourage your brothers and strengthen your brothers and sisters. Christ. That's the thing about God, you know. He picks one and he rejects the other. He took Peter and rejected you. Huh? Well, you weren't good enough. That's funny. I, I listen to some of you pray. I do. I listen to some of you pray, and it's kind of funny because you, 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 you always say the same thing. You know, uh, you pray for somebody who's got cancer, and they live, and you say, God answered your prayers. <laughs> I picked you. And others of you pray for God to heal the cancer, and he doesn't pick you. plane goes down, and one person survives. Praise to God. But well, didn't the other 200 people on the plane pray? Guess you weren't good enough. To be thrown away. For something somebody else did. Every single one of you. Every single one of you is one choice away from being thrown away. Mark my words. Honestly, God owes each and every one of us nothing. Romans says this. 
What shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Next slide. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Next slide. Therefore, God has mercy on who he wants to have mercy and hardens whom he wants to harden. The fact is, it's God's sovereign choice, and he can do exactly whatever he wants. It's, it's God. So there's no excuse. There's no apology. That's how God's work. But God is consistent. God is very consistent. He says this. He says, I desire that all men be saved. I desire that every single person be saved. And if a person, it doesn't matter how vile of an individual you are, it doesn't matter what you've done or what you're doing, doesn't matter how vile of a person you are, if anyone calls, on his God, calls out for God's salvation, if they desire for to be saved, if they believe in their heart that that God raised Jesus from the dead and they call his name Lord, they will be saved. Here is a, a theological hypothesis, but I would take it to the bank. Had Judas called out for salvation, Judas would have been saved. Because the disgusting crucifixion of God himself is enough to pay for his sins too. Had he repented. Oh, but he did repent. What else do you want from him? He took a rope. He hung himself from a tree. What else do you want? And as his body rotted, eventually it just fell face forward on the rocks and just his entrails blew up. What else do you want? How much sorry do you want? Drove him to commit the unforgivable sin. Suicide. One mistake. One mistake. And you can be lost too. One mistake. Judas committed the unforgivable sin, but suicide is not the unforgivable sin. How many of you heard that? Suicide is unforgivable. You know why you hear that? Because of the lies that Satan tells. That Jesus can save you, but if you go to your deathbed and you forgot to ask for forgiveness for one sin, well, then you're lost forever. And obviously, if you commit suicide right before you die, you can't ask for forgiveness for that sin. So Jesus doesn't cover for that. Who of us could be saved if that was the case? How many of you think today you committed a sin and you don't even know it? You did. You have. You've done it. You are so far off of God's standards that you sin daily, daily. Judas committed the unforgivable sin, and what was it? He rejected the call of Jesus Christ from day one. He rejected who Jesus said he was. He rejected God's command in his life. And by doing that up until the point that he died, he rejected Jesus Christ, and in that, he is separated for all of eternity. A young person asked me the other day, how do, I, how do I know? Am I that person? And I said, check for the fruit. Check for longevity. This Friday, as we look back 2,000 years ago, we see God's answer to a question that sometimes we forget to ask, or, 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 or maybe even beliefs, maybe that doubt that comes into our minds. Can I be lost? 
Am I believing something that, that isn't real? How can God forgive me for the things that I've done? Am I really saved? This is an exclamation point to the answer. If you'll just believe me, I've got you. And the resurrection is the reason why we have the hope that we do. Satan and his false teachers, be wary of them. They'll do anything and everything to separate you from the love of God. Let's pray. You can go down, buddy. Our hope is in you, Lord. Our desire is for you. Our anticipation is for you to work miracles in our lives, Father. Let us not be the reason for the change that we have, Father, but we ask that you change us inside and out. Father, the desire for you, the desire to serve you has to come from you. Father, the desire to love one another, to be known as your disciples, to be identified as your disciples by the love that we have for one another needs to be seen in our character. And only you can give us that, Father. So I ask for those brothers and sisters here today who maybe are doing a little retrospection of their life, introspection of their life, and they just don't see it. I ask that you just put your hand in their chest and you change them. You give them that new creation. Maybe they haven't moved or, or, or grown because of the, they haven't been abiding in you. But I, Father, I, I believe even that desire there to follow you is given by you. Give them that. Father, if there's a brother and sister in this room who is religious... Break them today. The law is meant to condemn us, not a system in which we have to live by to be saved. Save them. Maybe there's a brother or sister in here who is walking away from you right now. They're heading in the wrong direction, but they are a child of God. I pray that before they reach the pigs and the mud of a broken life, that they return home today, wrap their arms around a father who loves them and misses them so much. I pray for the saint who is just being tormented day and night by the tempter or the accuser of the brethren. That you remind them of how much you still love them. No amount of lies told by the enemy will erase the love that you have for them, Father. And I pray for the sick, the hurting the diseased, the dying. This world was never meant for us. And though you have the power and the, the sovereignty to change the direction in which they go, more important than anything at all, we pray that they have that strong relationship with you. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.